so excited to see many, many dear friends here who I've known through the internet but never actually met. And it's very, very exciting to be here. So I'm gonna talk about shaping noospheric adults from early childhood through the secondary level. And this focus particularly will be on Montessori cosmic education. Oh, oh wow. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. Um, show of hands, how many of you, now I know everybody knows Montessori, but how many of you are familiar with Montessori cosmic education, the specific cosmic education curriculum? Oh, okay, quite a few hands. Great, not everybody. And I do have to point out right over at that table, right over there, Kyle and Jana Herman are Montessori teachers and trainers. Extraordinary. Thank you so much for coming. Yay. <laughs> okay, so here we are at this conference and we're talking about this idea of a super organism and we're excited about it. You know, we're engaged in, I would call it an adventure, but a lot of the world is not feeling good and not feeling like part of a grand adventure. In education today, it's much more characterized by, I would say, radical separation. And it's a sense of fragmentation, a sense of alienation, depression. Fragmentation, because subjects are all taught as just fragments, but they're never put together into a transdisciplinary context. The alienation is there because people don't have a sense of purpose. That's not coming out of education, a sense of purpose. There's depression, there's a sense of hopelessness. Um, I certainly encounter this all the time with young people. And many of us have heard the statistic that um, in young people ages 10 to 24, the second leading cause of death is suicide. Can you imagine? Suicide. Something's wrong. Now, an antidote, one among many, though I think this is one of the best, is Montessori education. And just to give you a sense of scale, um, talk about a network girdling the earth. Montessori is a significant and resonant force in the whole world. Just some statistics, 15,763 schools around the world, 60,000 Montessori teachers in the world. More than a million students have attended a Montessori school. It's huge. This is a huge force in the world. Brian and I have given keynote addresses at the American Montessori Society, and there are thousands of people. You remember, right, Brian? You look out over just this sea of people who are there, taking it in, taking the ideas to their schools, and then in the schools to their parents and the grandparents and the cousins and the aunts and the uncles. And I just have to say one of my sort of missions here is to say for all the academics and so on, to see this as one of the ways to get your ideas out into the world and to really make it real, okay? So this is an amazing place because it's resonant. It's resonant with your ideas. So Maria Montessori, she lived from 1870 to 1952. She was one of the first women medical doctors in Italy. There's a whole story around her becoming a medical doctor. It was an incredible obstacles that she encountered and overcame to become one of the first women medical doctors. And what she learned in that process was the art of observation and that is just really studying the real world. Not just making up ideas about it, but actually learning, taking the wisdom from the world, really observing it very, very carefully. And what did that do for her? 
it gave her a breakthrough in the understanding of the consciousness of the child. So the child is not just this empty vessel, you know, with the teacher up at the front, pouring all this information into the empty vessel. No, the child has their own interiority, their own fascinations, their own absorbent mind, where they're absorbing what's around them, and they become absorbed in activities. Like just this simple thing, like pouring water, pouring water, the simple act of pouring water for a young child is an act of learning. So these kinds of sensorial activities are in the early childhood classroom where the child can repeat the activity over and over and over again. I'm sure that all of you have seen this with your children or with your grandchildren, that they do activities and then repeat them because they're learning that way. So it wasn't just the consciousness of the child that she had the insight into. Maria Montessori also was adamant about the spiritual preparation of the teacher. The teacher has to be spiritually prepared to teach. You can't just give somebody information and expect them to go off and just pour that in. Our goal is not so much the imparting of knowledge as the unveiling and developing of spiritual energy. So another thing that Maria Montessori observed so carefully was that all children go through stages of development or planes of development, as she called it. And there are three basic categories here. There are subcategories, but I'm just going to go into basic categories. Zero to six, six to 12, and 12 to 18. In the first basically 30 years of her life, of her professional life, she focused on the zero to six age group. <clears throat> That's the early childhood. And I'm sure that all of you have seen, you know, Montessori schools that are for the zero to six age group. But then, incredibly, in the 40s, she began to develop cosmic education for the elementary level. That's six to 12. A lot of people have no idea about this. It's like one of the best <laughs> kept secrets in the world. I just find this amazing. So how did this happen? Well, she was invited to India by the Theosophical Society, interestingly. And while she was in India, World War II breaks out. And so she and her son, she's sitting, her, the man right behind her is her son, Mario. She and her son, Mario, are put under house arrest in India. That turned out to be the best thing. Why? Because while they were in India, they developed the cosmic education curriculum, drawing upon her um, background as a scientist, scientific observation, her Catholic background, a person of deep faith, and in the context of India, with its grand philosophy. So what did she say? She said, let us give the child a vision of the whole universe, no matter what we touch, an atom or a cell. We cannot explain it without knowledge of the wide universe. Now, why did she choose the elementary level to develop this curriculum? Because she observed through careful study she observed that at age six, that's when the child asked the question, where do I come from? Where does everything come from? Why am I here? Where am I going? These are all what? Time dimensional questions, right? 
and they happen at age six. Certainly my son was that way, right on the dot. I mean, you could have set the clock, six o'clock, age six. Where did everything come from? Where does the moon go? Where is, you know, all these questions, time dimensional questions. So with these three planes of development, zero to six, six to 12, and 12 to 18, each phase goes through a particular characteristics. This first one, zero to six, is the age of the senses, getting to know the world through the senses, touch, taste, smell, everything that's like right in front of you. We've all seen kids do this, put everything in their mouths, right? They're getting to know the world. So at each phase, the question is, how is that child getting to know the universe and their place within it? So in this first phase, through the senses, this world of wonder and exploration. Then the second plane, as we just found out, age six, that's when they asked the question, where did everything come from? So Maria Montessori said, ah, they're asking the question about where everything came from. That's the time to tell them <clears throat> the story of the universe. Don't wait until high school. Don't wait, certainly, until college. Tell them in an age-appropriate way when they're asking the question. So that's when the great stories, the cosmic stories, are told at the elementary level. Now, what's interesting is that the child can learn the story but they don't see themselves in the story yet. That starts to happen in the adolescent years. And that's why the adolescent years are so, I'd say delicate in a way, because it's scary. All of a sudden you're like, oh my gosh, I'm actually in the story. I have, it's not just a flat screen story out there, I'm in it. So it's a very, very sort of dangerous time in a way because you begin to realize, do I have a role? Do I have a place? And if you begin to question that, you can see how a lot of pathologies can set in. So what is it? A definition of cosmic education. It's a unitary vision of the universe. We're going to get into a minute how we go across levels. Two, the universe is evolving. All right, now I want you to think about something. She came out with the book to educate the human potential in 1947. That's uh, where she laid out the cosmic education curriculum. H Hubble proved that the universe was expanding you know, in 1930, 1929, 1930, she began to create this entire curriculum grounded inside the cosmic story, a story of an expanding universe. <laughs> Within 10 years of, uh, you know, she started the process. Within 10 years of that discovery by Hubble, that's extraordinary. You know, it took so long for, most other educators to come anywhere near, and they most have never caught up. <laughs> um, number three, passing from whole to detail. So you start with the big picture, then work down to the details. So the child always gets the big picture not lots of different fragments, all these subjects that are just like fragments thrown in. First, the big picture, then the details, the interdependence of everything. And here's the kicker. What's our job? To participate in evolution. 
That's our job. She said, humans are cosmic agents. Our purpose is to evolve the universe. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? She said that in the 40s. Is anybody astounded here? Yes. <laughs> and she's a woman. <laughs> Sorry, I have to say that. Oh my God. <laughs> Um, sorry, get a little excited there. Okay, so the idea here is we all have a cosmic gift and task. We have gifts. What is a cosmic gift and a task? A cosmic gift and task is a gift that we have that we do because we love it, because we're selfish, we want to do it, but it also is a benefit to the whole. So let's take plants. And here's the thing, it's not just humans that have cosmic gifts and tasks. Everything has a cosmic gift and task. Plants, animals, everything has a cosmic, the whole, our whole earth has a cosmic gift and task. Let yourself think about that for a while. We have a cosmic gift and task as a planet. But let's look at, at plants, for example. Plants break through photosynthesis. They break apart water molecules, release that oxygen up into the atmosphere, and then it becomes available to animals. They're doing it for themselves. They're not doing it for the animals, but it has the benefit of offering something to the animals. So you might think for yourselves, What's your cosmic gift and task? You might have several. You might think about that. What am I doing that I really, really love and that is also giving at the same time to the whole? That's where your cosmic gift and task is. So there are five great themes or great stories that extend across all of the levels from zero to six, six to 12, 12 to 18. And guess what? Starts first with the story of the universe. That's number one, that's the big one. And then nested inside of that, the story of earth and life. Nested inside of that, the story of humans. Nested inside of that, the story of communication. Nested inside of that, the story of math. Everything is taught as a story, not static. So for example, this fourth one, communication, that's where reading and writing comes in. That's taught by where the kids learn how to make marks in clay or on trees, the way that humans first learn to write. And then they get the idea, I can write because human beings a long time ago figured this out. They figured it out. This wasn't here all the time. And that turns life into something entirely different, doesn't it? Can you see that? How it's totally different when you realize that everything that we have here today wasn't here at one point. It had to come into being. So all of these great themes and stories provide a scaffolding so that all subjects are in the scaffolding. 
From the universe, we get physics and chemistry. And earth, life, you get biology, we get earth science. Humans, we get the story of humans, we get anthropology. And there's a whole amazing unit on human needs, which goes right into cultures and how different cultures answer the questions of human needs. It's a beautiful curriculum. And then communication. Again, this idea of differentiation. Communication is so differentiated by, through ad, animals have different ways of communicating. And all different cultures have different ways of communicating. And then math is a kind of communication, kind of symbolic thinking. So it all fits together. Our aim is to touch his imagination, to enthuse him to his inmost core. And then Mario says, storytelling comes first, then study. So I wrote a series of books, a universe story trilogy that tells the story of the universe. There are three books, Born with a Bang, From Lava to Life, Mammals Who Morph. So the first one is the first great story. The second one, or the story of the universe, the second one is the second great story, the story of life and the earth. The third, Mammals Who Morph, is a human story. So that's the third great story or theme. And they were illustrated by Dana Lynn Anderson, an extraordinary artist who lives here in California. And of course, a story needs a storyteller. So my neighbor came over and she said one day, I'm gonna make this robe for you. And I said, oh, what? Are you kidding? And she says, yeah, I'm gonna make lights. We're gonna put stars all over it. And, and, I, and you need to use this. So I said, okay, whatever, go, go ahead. So anyway, I, as soon as my books came out, I started getting a lot of invitations to Montessori schools and doing trainings and so on all over. So I wasn't gonna do this, but Casey, right over there, <laughs> said, you have to give them a little taste of storytelling. So I'm gonna give you just a very little, little taste. So these, these stories are told in the voice of the universe. And I didn't bring any of my props or anything. I didn't bring the robe because I wasn't planning to do this. <laughs> but Casey said, you got to do it. <laughs> so, so, okay. Um, all right, so for me to get into my universe voice, I don't have my thunder tube. So I'm gonna ask you all to create some noise. And, Okay, wait, stop. I wasn't ready. <laughs> I'll tell you when to start. <laughs> and so you'll make some noise. And that was perfect, by the way. That was a really good rehearsal. Um, and uh, then I'll start, and this will be really, really short. <clears throat> My dear earthlings, you may not know me. I am the universe. And it's time for us to get to know each other. After all, I'm 14 billion years old now. And how old do you think you are? 10, 20, 50, 70? Oh no, you are 14 billion years old too. You are part of me. You have always been part of me from the very beginning. And that's why I'm gonna tell you a story about me, which is a story about you 
to. Once upon a time, I was a tiny, tiny speck, smaller than a piece of dust under your bed. But I couldn't stay small. I blew, blew up to the size of a galaxy. I had to find exactly the right speed to grow, you know. If I grew just a little bit too quickly, I would have exploded and disappeared into nothingness. If I grew just a little bit too slowly, I would have collapsed and crushed into nothingness. But I found exactly the right speed to grow. Now, that's not to say that things were peaceful. Oh, no, there was chaos everywhere, glowing bolts of energy everywhere, and they collapsed into the very first things, the very first particles, the very first stuff. This stuff, these particles were floating around everywhere. There were protons and electrons, and they began to come together, and they turned into something amazing. The very first element I'm talking about, hydrogen. Was I proud of turning myself into the very first element, hydrogen? You bet I was. Thank you. So you can see a shift in perspective from fragments to the whole, a radical sense of belonging, a zest for life comes out of that. It's a functional cosmology, which Thomas Berry talked about. And if this is the capacity to build the noosphere. What Thomas Berry says, we will go into the future as a single sacred community or we perish. I just want to note that these two things came out at the very same time. Maria Montessori's To Educate the Human Potential in 1947 and chapter 10 of Teilhard's book, The Future of Man, about the noosphere in 1947. They didn't know anything about each other. Incredible, right? Um, I just want to give a plug for the American Tay Art Association. I'm on that board. It's a great organization. They're doing a lot of wonderful programs. My own organization, the Deep Time Network, we have members all over the world. Check it out. Uh, we have a Deep Time Leadership and Wellbeing Program, and, uh, which is a leadership program, nine months and three modules, and it's, it's transforming lives. It's just amazing. And so I will just close with this one quote, which is an adaptation of the Montessori quote <clears throat> uh, by Orla Hazra, who's on our board, the Deep Time uh, Network board, and you'll see the twist that she puts in there. She said, let's give the child a vision of the universe so that the child sees that it's the universe giving them the vision. Right? You got it. You got the twist there? Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much.